Alfred Hitchcock's 1954 classic, Rear Window, starring James Stewart and Grace Kelly, is considered by many to be one of Hitchcock's most deeply emotional movies. Yet, it's a murder mystery, but it's also wrapped in this exploration of an entire community of lonely characters struggling with marriages, romances, or careers. Now, one of those characters is nicknamed Miss Lonely Hearts, a middle-aged woman looking for love and crying herself to sleep each night. The first time we see her, she's preparing a candlelit dinner and going through the motions of a date. Now, as a viewer, you suspect that she's trying to make everything perfect before her date arrives. But it isn't long before you realize that she isn't rehearsing, she's fantasizing. Lonely, she finally breaks down crying and buries her head in her arms. Now, if this was the 50s, it wasn't happy days for everyone. Marilyn Monroe, who had the world at her feet for about a decade, died in 1962 from an overdose of sleeping pills. In one of her private journals, she wrote on the very first page, quote, Alone. I am alone. I am always alone, no matter what, end quote. On October 4, 1970, the famed rock star Janis Joplin was found dead in her Los Angeles hotel room. She was only 27 years old. Police reported that they located a small quantity of heroin in Joplin's room. There were also needle marks on her arm. And just before the incident, she had admitted to a friend, quote, When I'm not on the stage, I just lie around and watch TV and feel very lonely, end quote. The king of rock and roll, Elvis Presley, just before he died in 1977, wrote a note that said, quote, I feel so alone sometimes. Help me, Lord. End quote. Now, there are millions of stories like these from the famous and the not so famous. And it's because loneliness is a far more common and far more serious problem than we think. One of the most surprising statistics that I came across in researching this episode was this idea that every seven years we lose about half our friends. Half. And friendship networks themselves have been shrinking for at least the last 30 years. The recent research has found that people are now, get this, four to five times more likely to have no friends compared to the early 1990s. The amount of men who have no friends has risen fivefold, and the amount of women who have no friends has risen fourfold. There's other research that says that the average person hasn't made a new friend in the last five years, even though about half of people report that they would like to make a new friend if they only knew how. Now, is this a serious issue? Well, Dr. Marissa Franco, a counseling psychologist and friendship expert, believes that this is a true crisis. She says that having friends and having connections for us as social creatures is essential to both our physical health and our sense of identity. And two-time U.S. Surgeon General and Vice Admiral Vivek Murthy agrees, saying it appears that loneliness is strongly associated with an increased risk for heart disease, dementia, depression, and anxiety. Murthy even points out that people who struggle with loneliness also have fragmented sleep. So they may sleep for the same number of hours as everyone else, but that sleep is typically broken up by what's called micro-awakenings. In other words, they don't fully wake up, but they nearly wake up. And so it diminishes the quality of their sleep. Franco and Murthy both point out that the mortality rate for loneliness is similar to that of, no joke, smoking 15 cigarettes a day and greater than the mortality impact of either obesity or sedentary living. That's almost unbelievable, but the data is pretty compelling. But there's another feature of loneliness that makes it as much of a public health threat as so many other big challenges, and that's its commonality. Dr. Jeffrey Cohen says the epidemic of loneliness is serious, even though the figures aren't as high as the 50% number often thrown around by the mainstream media. Franco, Murthy, and Cohen all say that the actual numbers are more like 22%. Now, that's still an awful lot, especially when you consider that there are more than 329 million people in the United States. 
So that's roughly 73 million lonely people. And to put this in context, 22% is more than the number of people who smoke cigarettes. And it's more than the people who even have diabetes. So this is exceedingly common. That means that you can pick any five friends and at least one of them is likely struggling with loneliness or you may be that one in five. But despite its commonality, we don't tend to realize that the people close to us are feeling lonely because they and we are so good at hiding it. Murthy says people are surprisingly open to talk about their struggles with obesity or addiction, but we're significantly less open to talking about our struggles with loneliness. There's a real stigma around loneliness that seems to be universal, as if admitting that you feel lonely makes you somehow not likable or deficient in some way. This keeps a lot of people from admitting their struggles. But in close conversations and private moments, people of all ages and social groups willingly admit to struggling with loneliness, at least from time to time. Now, I'm very much an introvert, but even introverts get lonely. And when an introvert feels lonely, we feel it very acutely. And let's be clear here. Chronic, prolonged loneliness is a serious problem. In fact, according to Cohen, the word loneliness doesn't really capture the depth of despair that some people feel. Some research estimates that as many as 180,000 deaths per year are directly linked to social pain and despair. It is an awful noxious psychological state to be in because, as Cohen says, one of the worst things that our central nervous system can communicate to the rest of our bodies is that we are alone. But it's also important to note that loneliness is not just a feeling. It's actually a mindset, a way of seeing the world. Studies show that lonely people actually report liking people they interact with less and they automatically assume people are going to dislike them as well. If you're of the mindset that no one wants to hear from you and you don't want to hear from anyone, that devalues the whole idea of connections. But here's the real kicker. People who are lonely often both want to connect and withdraw at the same time. So it's a very confusing and even paralyzing feeling. That makes it really hard to get out of loneliness if it's really entrenched. So when we're experiencing loneliness, we need to remind ourselves that it's probably not because of what others are thinking or feeling about us, but because of what we ourselves are thinking and feeling. Our own thoughts and feelings are shaping how we interpret everything else. For example, some common misconceptions that we have about loneliness include one, telling ourselves that loneliness only affects a sad minority of people, the widowed, the withdrawn, the weird. But this just isn't true. As the statistics show, loneliness is nearly universal. Number two, we think that a busy life and a bustling office or school or workplace means that we can't be lonely. It's really a lie that we tell ourselves. For adults especially, sometimes it's simply our busyness that actually keeps us lonely. We can get caught up in life and convince ourselves that we're staying busy for, quote, really important things, end quote, and then use that as justification for letting our relationship slide. The cost of that misprioritization is greater than we can possibly imagine. Number three, we think that having kids or a loving spouse can satisfy all of our complex social needs. I'll touch on that in a few minutes. And number four, we usually assume that our friendships just happen automatically. Newsflash, they usually don't. So the psychological community seems to be united about this one thing, if nothing else. Loneliness is an awful, noxious psychological state to be in. But why? Why do our bodies and minds work this way? Personally, I think the simple answer is that it's because God created us that way. He purposefully designed us to need one another. We were created by God to be in relationships with others. Listen to Genesis 2.18. Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper as his complement. Now, the context here is clear. Adam and Eve, male and female, husband and wife, were created for one another. 
That's God's perfect design, God's perfect plan. But I think that verse has broader application as well. It isn't good for humans to be alone. We need each other. Honestly, I don't think you could go wrong by suggesting that it could also be said, it isn't good for humans to be lonely. Science certainly affirms that supposition. In fact, the evidence suggests that, just like a proper diet or exercise routine, we also need a variety of social interactions to stay healthy and avoid loneliness because, as I mentioned earlier, our social needs are complex. Murthy says there are three types of loneliness. Number one, intimate loneliness, which is feeling that you lack a close confidant, somebody you can deeply trust with just about everything, somebody who knows you deeply and who you know deeply. When you lack that kind of relationship, then you will experience intimate loneliness. Number two, relational loneliness, which is primarily a lack of friendships. These are the people we would get together with on the weekends, etc. People we do stuff with. Franco says that friendships, according to some research, can actually bring us more joy than other types of relationships. Uh, That may be because friendships aren't encumbered with the same responsibility or weight and obligations that intimate relationships can have. They're typically just relationships of lighthearted fun and pleasure. Number three, collective loneliness, which is when you don't have the benefit of identity with a common group. Now, Murthy says we need all three of these types of connections, intimate, relational, and collective, in order to feel connected in the most comprehensive way. And we also need to make sure that we're getting the right doses of each of these three types on a regular basis. I barely scratched the surface on this topic. In part two of this mini-series, I want to explore how this need to connect or belong drives our behavior. And then I want to look at what both psychology and the Bible agree are the best solutions to this common problem. For now, remember, a better mind always leads to a better life.